today's message is not from uh, my first day was from one passage the second day was from the first few chapters of acts this time we are going to the whole new testament uh, and uh, uh, you know a, a time of coming back to roots as uh, what jubilee is uh, one of the things that the D forms the dna of asian access and also of youth for christ for which i work is um, is parenthood spiritual parenthood discipling mentoring um, but this is one thing that can get lost i tell our people in youth for christ one generation we can lose this and if we lose that we lose our ministry um, and so this is something that needs to be reminded over and over and over again you must have heard numerous messages on mentoring uh, but we are going to have another one today uh, and i'm using the idea of the spiritual parent as uh, as the metaphor the father son metaphor uh, found in the bible um, uh, which is a good way to describe leadership as it is envisaged in the bible and the word that paul uses and jesus also uh, is the word technon my child sometimes translated my son but it's not the normal word for um son that word is huios which comes 380 times in the new testament this one comes 99 times in the new testament and it is a more affectionate term than the normal term son um for example 1 uh, corinthians 4:17 timothy my beloved and faithful child in the lord 1 Timothy 1:2 Timothy my child my true child in the faith 1 Timothy 1:18 uh Timothy my child 2 Timothy 1:2 Timothy my beloved child 2 Timothy 2:1 you then my child Titus 1:4 Titus my true child then Philemon 1:10 my child Onesimus and then Jesus to his disciples in Mark 10:24 children how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of god all these cases it's the same word technon there's a related word technion which uh, john uses in his epistles uh, which is translated my little children jesus uses that in john 13 and verse 33 uh, when he says little children a little while i am with you uh, this is uh, so then this is a term of endearment that's how one of the Uh, the logos uh, package uh, uh, describes it uh, a term of endearment uh, the, one of the popular uh, lexicons says uh, says it's used like this my child my dear friend my dear man my de my dear one my dear lad uh, all of these have the idea of affection sometimes it's used for the whole flock like in galatians 4:19 where jesus says little children for whom i am again in the pains of in the anguish of childbirth until christ is formed in you here as often uh, the parenthood metaphor uh, takes the form of a mother and paul describes himself as a mother here and in the thessalonian epistles um so um uh, so so the affection the, the word here has the idea of affection So in 2 Timothy 1:2 he talks of him as Timothy my beloved child and then in verse 4 he says as i remember your tears i long to see you that i may be filled with joy you can see the joy and the pain of mentoring of discipling of spiritual parenthood as i remember your tears i long to see you so that i may be filled with joy and uh, one of my favorites Uh, is Philemon 10 verse 10 uh, where he says uh, where uh, uh, Paul tells Philemon about my child Onesimus whose father I became in my imprisonment and then in verse 12 he says I am sending him back to you sending my very heart now the word used there is the word splagna which is the word which really means bowels uh, in the, uh, those days uh, compassion um, the seat of feelings was 
they, they thought was the bowels. So he was saying, telling them, I'm sending you my bowels. I'm sending you my heart. Now remember, Paul was an aristocratic, highly educated Jew. And Onesimus was a former slave who had stolen from his Christian master. And such a tie of affection had developed between this high class person and this person whom society would have rejected. Uh, so we are talking about deeply felt compassion. Uh, Paul, Paul, of course, therefore, we can assume, uh, adopted an open-hearted approach to ministry. Not everyone opened their hearts to him, but he opened his hearts to them. And this is one of the things about discipling. Often people don't open their hearts to us, but we do uh, to those God has called us to mentor or disciple. Uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 7, 2, Paul says, Make room in your hearts for us. Uh, and, and this is a problem. The, 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 the Corinthians were not making room in their hearts for them. Um, so he's virtually begging them, please, please, open your hearts to me. Um, and um, um, and, and um, uh, so, so you see affection and commitment here. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, he says, I will most gladly spend and be expended for you. If I love you the more, am I to be loved the less? You can see a man begging, please love me. Uh, he's begging with them to love him. Uh, this, this type of affection comes in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8, where Paul says, We were gentle among you like a nursing mother caring for her own children. And then he uses a beautiful word, so being affectionately desirous. Being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. So we keep, uh, you know, we, we like, sometimes we like to, to keep our distance. In fact, a uh, pastor once told me, that he was advised not to be friends with his congregation, you know, um, because it's, uh, he can't be a leader if he gets too friendly with the congregation. Quite different to Jesus who said, I don't call you servants anymore, I call you my friends. Uh, we like to keep our distance, we don't like to be vulnerable to pain. When you open yourself like this, you become uh, vulnerable to pain. So, three aspects of discipling, open heart, affection, and commitment. Um, now, uh, in Asia today, we are seeing three models of leadership. And some of these models people are aspiring after. Uh, so let me just talk about those three models very briefly. The first is the CEO model, where the leader is the chief executive officer. It's a very efficient way of running an organization. There is a, there is a good uh, flow chart, uh, of how things happen, and organizational chart, and, um, and, um, and, and the leader is able to unhindered present the vision and help the movement to move forward. Uh, but, there are, but that misses a lot of key features in Christian service. The other one, I must say very sadly, is the royal model that is getting more and more popular in South Asia, I don't know how the, it is in the other parts of Asia, um, where the leader is the king, and uh, uh, he orders people around. Um, others are at his beck and call. He's somewhat distanced from the people. I think this is, a, this is something that uh, I feel has come from the South Indian model of the guru, uh, the Hindu, uh, Hindu uh, like God-man who's like a king, and people just, he remains distant from the people, but he has a very high position. And, and today, um, junior people are, are aspiring for this. They are going through the pain of having, of being at the beck and call of the king, and then uh, they just wait for this sponsor who will take them on. And, and then they start off on their own, so that they too can be senior pastors. 
The third model is what you find in older churches. Uh, and, um, and it is the committee model, where the leader doesn't have the, uh, the, the ability to exercise spiritual authority and, um, and to lead with spiritual uh, power amongst the people. And that is certainly a very difficult model to work with. It's something that I have to work with living in, going to an older church. Uh, it is something that I have to struggle with, but uh, uh, okay. So these don't help. <laughs> uh, these don't help uh, develop disciples of Christ. Um, now let me just say one, one more, um, a, a, a point that I have begin, begun to realize more and more recently. These people are discipled into the body. You know, um, many models of discipling are very individualistic. You know, one person disciples one person. Uh, and I think that's, that's fine. That is the way it should happen. But children are born into a family. So when they are discipled, they are discipled into a family, within the context of a family. So while discipling is individual, it is not individualistic. The disciple cannot be separated from the body of Christ. And let me say that for, for some of us who have some very glaring weaknesses that disqualify us from leadership, if the people we discipled were only, um, were only discipled by us, they would grow up to be stunted in their, they, they, would, they would be stunted in their growth. And so we need others to influence them. So we are not exclusive. Uh, disciples. I, I, I think of five people who were my disciples, and they are all very different at different times. The most influential was my mother, uh, who led me to Christ, who taught me the Bible. And then I had a pastor in church who showed me the glory of the ministry and, and the beauty of holiness. And then I had a Youth for Christ leader who really discipled us in the traditional sense of the term. And then I had a man who became my spiritual father in seminary, Robert Coleman. Uh, and then I had uh, my mentor at Fuller Seminary who helped me uh, to become a writer and to argue for the truth, a man called Daniel Fuller. And so all of them were very different, but they completed, I mean, I'm not complete yet, but <laughs> they brought some sort of completion <laughs> to my training as a, as a, as a Christian. Uh, so the growth passages of the Bible are plural. People grow together. So as soon as the uh, people were converted in Acts 2, 41, and those who, were received, who received the word were baptized, and they were added uh, that day about 3,000 souls. The next verse says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And then there are those three wonderful parables in, in Luke chapter 15. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. In each case, the response to them coming back was a communal response. The people got together and they celebrated as a community when a person came. So ideally, I suppose the, grow, the place to grow is a small group where people can minister to each other and enc encourage each other. Um, and, uh, and that leads them uh, to the wider body of which they finally become, um, that becomes their primary identity. So spiritual parents disciple children within the context of the family. Now you see this with Jesus and the Twelve. A lot of their training and their teaching was done together. Uh, they were. They may have been. There may have, must have been individualistic, uh, in individual uh, appointments, uh, but um, and practically this is a necessity. Uh, parents need to have time alone with one child, uh, each individual child. But its context was discipling within the 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 group. Uh, Jesus. Uh, um, so so we find uh, that Jesus teaches them together. They travel together, they quarrel and debate together, they are sent on ministries in twos, and they come and report to the group. Now, within the context of this group, 
as they spend time together, communication of truth takes place and ties of affection develop. So within this group, so right at the start of the ministry, uh, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And two of John's disciples hear this, and they follow Jesus. And Jesus looks back and says, this is John 1.38, What are you seeking? And, um, and they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And Jesus says, Come, and you will see. And they come, and they saw, and they stayed with him. It was the 10th hour, we are told, that's about 4 p.m. And then, we are told, they spent the day with him. Possibly that means that they spent the night also with him. Uh, because from 4 o'clock, if they spent the day, it must have been that they spent the night. Uh, so, Robert Coleman says, The only way a father can properly raise a family is to be with them. Of course, this is particularly true of a mother. Uh, the Gospels re often record Jesus as being in the homes of people. He is in the home of Simon, he is in the home of Matthew, he is in the home of Lazarus. Uh, so, as I said yesterday, um, this is a place where relationships uh, can develop, warm relationships can develop. And then, when Jesus chose the twelve, uh, there are three reasons given for his choosing the twelve. He chose these twelve first of, and for, uh, first of all, that they may be with him. That was the first reason, to be with him. And second, to send them out to preach and then have authority to cast out demons. His basic call to the disciples is, follow me. Uh, Dr. Coleman, Robert Coleman says that this was the major difference between the teaching of the rabbis the training of the rabbis and the training of Jesus. The rabbis had a strict regime of rituals, rituals and formulas of knowledge. You know, they had to follow this strict regime. Whereas Jesus said, follow me. Uh, that was his way of training people. Later, Paul also adopted this approach. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So you find Jesus intentionally taking his disciples with him as he goes to places and being alone with them. Sometimes he's in Gentile territory, hiding and teaching them. Uh, for example, I've given you uh, three passages from Mark. The first one, he's in Tyre and Sidon, which is in, which is in northwest, northwest of Israel. Of, uh, of the Jewish nation. Uh, then he is in the regions of Dec Decapolis, uh, Mark 7:31, which is the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, completely opposite positions. Then he is in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, which is in the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee, as you would look here. So there he is in the west, then he is in the east, and now he has gone to the north of Israel. Why? These are largely Gentile cities. These are retreats that he has with his group. And so we too need to be having times when we go together as a group and enjoy ourselves and also enjoy learning and talking about the things of God. Sometimes you find him hiding and teaching the disciples. In Mark 9, 30 to 31, they went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples. This is one of the big problems I have when I go to a Youth for Christ Center. I tell them I don't want to have any public meetings. Please give me some time with the staff. And, um, and they think, no, Ajit has come. We have to arrange a meeting for him. You know, and, uh, and so sometimes I have to, after they send the schedule, I have to say, please cut off some of these talks. I like to spend some time with you and with the, and with, with the YFC staff and volunteers. Uh, so, so sometimes we have to hide in order to do this. Uh, uh, he goes, uh, when he goes to the Mount of uh, Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, he goes there to pray. And then Luke 9.37 says, On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, 
and that's the time that they met this uh, boy who was uh, uh, possessed and they healed him uh, who the disciples couldn't heal and Jesus healed them now it says on the next day so probably Jesus had spent the night with Peter James and John probably he had done, he had been with them all night so uh, they are going to learn by observing following and hearing so after the resurrection in acts 1:3 uh, we are told that he appears to them during 40 days speaking about the kingdom of god that's how truth is communicated and john of course caught this uh, so when he was writing his epistles uh, john 1 john 1 1 he says that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning what the word we saw we heard we touched with our hands the word the word was communicated and then in verse 3 he says that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you seen heard and touched uh, robert coleman again says knowledge was gained by association before it was understood by explanation now it doesn't mean that some people say truth is caught and not taught i think it's very clear in the bible that truth is taught it is taught and caught both are important teaching and um, and modeling uh, paul tells timothy in 2 timothy 3 uh, 10 and 11 you however have followed my teaching my conduct my aim in life my faith my patience my love my steadfastness my persecutions and sufferings all these things he says you followed this uh, his life was an open book and timothy and paul were close friends and he could follow now that word translated follow here has the idea of observed the revised english bible translated observed closely um, uh, donald guthrie says it's to trace out as an example this is the word that Luke used in his prologue when he said, I have carefully examined. You remember he said, I have carefully examined these facts. This is the same word that is used here. And it's very interesting. This is po po pointed out by Bill Mounts in his commentary on the pastorals. Bill Mounts says that, um, that all these things, you know, he says, my life, my conduct, my, way of, my faith, my patience, my love, all of these things are presented to Timothy as exhortations in the, in the pastoral epistles, in 1 and 2 Timothy. So he presents them as exhortations, as admonitions to him. But he has also seen it in Timothy's life. So what he, uh, what he tells them is what they have seen. And, and, and so, uh, so they became friends and communicated that way. Uh, the, the, the beautiful way this is described is in John 15 and 15. Towards the end of his life, Jesus says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for, because, that's the word there, because all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. It's a friendship that has been forged in teaching. Being with them and teaching them is the heart of discipling. Generally, people don't immediately open up to us. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. I remember once I was asked to uh, lead our drug rehab work after a very popular leader who had pioneered this work left. And, um, and he was a good discipler. And the three staff in that drug rehab ministry were well discipled by him. But now he has left and I had to take over. And they were going to him all the time, not to me, right? And it was a bit of a problem because uh, now I had to take leadership of this ministry. And, and I, um, it took me about a year to win their confidence. And it was a year of hard work. I visited their homes, 
I prayed and prayed. I was virtually begging. It was not a leader saying, listen to me. It was a beggar saying, please listen to me. You know, and uh, please be my friend. But what happened was, that was, I think, the highlight of my career in Youth for Christ, was the time that I supervised the drug rehab work. Now that I have left uh, that job, um, a lot of my, I, I am doing a lot of mentoring, and several of the people I'm mentoring are former drug addicts who are now in full-time ministry. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, I serve as an advisor to the consortium of drug rehab agencies. That's been a very important part of my life, uh, one of the happy things in my life. But it took me about a year to win their confidence. So um, some, some won't open as, as, as quickly as we would like, but others will. Now, well, when we work with new Christians, our great aim is worldview change. Because the way people think is so different. We, we said that in our first talk to the Christian way of thinking. Um, they have no concept of grace. Um, you know, they go to God like going to a, 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 a soothsayer for magical rewards. Um, they go, they, it's okay to lie. And, and sometimes it's wrong to, not to lie in, in, our, in our way of thinking. It is certainly wrong not to take revenge if someone has offended your honor. This is the culture that we, 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 we have in our nations. And for them to transform this thinking is hard work. And worldview won't usually change after one or two messages. It's very important. Those messages form the base for worldview change. But the whole person must be actively involved in the process of worldview change. And so I have listed six ways in which means to worldview change. They must see it demonstrated in the leader, the truths that are being taught, demonstrated in the leader. They must talk about it as it applies to their personal life. This is one of the most important things. I have a discipleship group, um, and I must say that is the hardest aspect of my ministry right now. Uh, to have these new believers who, are, who have had lived a bit of an unusual life before they came to Christ. Um, and when we meet, we meet only once in three weeks because I travel and it's a little difficult, but we meet for about three to four hours. And the first one and a half hours, we are chatting. We are chatting about politics, about sports, about whatever, but as Christians. Uh, and, and the purpose here is that they learn to think about life as Christians. And they chat and they apply Christian truth to their own experience. So I think those days people used to call it holy conversation. You're talking uh, as Christians. Thirdly, we, there is personal admonition. There are times we must tell them, no, this is something Christians do not do. We don't take revenge. Uh, and, and so there is personal admonition. Number four, it must be taught. Taught rationally, point by point, and pictorially. Our people uh, find, uh, uh, discover truth rationally and intuitionally. Intuitively, sorry. Uh, they, they discover truth intuitively. So a story, uh, an experience, uh, you know, it just has a way of getting into the system through the feelings and not through the rational uh, cognitive uh, process. And so, so teaching takes place rationally and, um, uh, and, and pictorially. When, people, when truth gets buried into the hearts of the people. And then sixth point is through divine interventions. I think that's another way that worldview changes. You see this in, uh, in Pentecost. The disciples, uh, they knew all the things. Jesus had taught them, taught them, taught them. And then there was this wonderful experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
and it was a paradigm shift that took place. Ministry now became ministry in the spirit. The same thing happened to uh, Peter uh, in, in Joppa when he knew the truth that Christ broke human barriers, but he ha it hadn't internalized in his life. And he has this vision and an accompanying you know, people coming and all of that, and he changed his theology based on what he saw. So, so divine interventions help cause change. So six ways in which change takes place in the, in the hearts of people. Uh, now, as they hear, they act out, they discuss, they see, slowly we change. And what 2 Timothy 3, 18, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says takes place. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So with Jesus, uh, the disciples, it took a long time. So I think we also need to be patient when we are working with people. Okay, so that's a basic sort of thing on parenthood. Uh, let me just say that this is a very countercultural activity today. Uh, I think this is why uh, we naturally tend towards not parenting spiritually uh, because of the pressure, the cultural pressure that we live with. This is a busy world in which a key is productivity and spending time on a few people seems to be a waste of resources. And, um, and there are similar objections to earthly parenting today. Kent Hughes, in his book, uh, The Disciplines of a Godly Family, says, talks about the deceptive mathematics of worldly thinking that considers pouring out one's life on a hidden few as a scandalous waste of one's potential. You understand what he's saying? Having to do a person with so much ability, so much capability, spending so much time bringing up a child, it's a waste of our resources it's, uh, and potential, it seems. I think we, we need to remember that this is the way the kingdom grows. And this is the method of Jesus. Uh, one of the things that I've had to try and bring into my life as a, as a check uh, because we get so many invitations, so many opportunities, and most of them have to be uh, left behind. And, and one of the things that I have had for my own self, I mean, I'm not pushing this for everybody, but, um, uh, and that is, prominence is a burden that goes with a call. Some people are called to public ministry, so it makes them a little prominent. But it's not a big deal. Personal work, is our badge of honor. Prominence is a burden that goes with a call. Personal work is our badge of honor. So this is a busy world. Then this is an active world, where people are used to being active. Unfortunately, today they are mostly active mentally on the, in front of the computer or the mobile phone. Uh, so. So they're, they're, they're uh, you know, to stop and talk for a long time with a few people, uh, you know, it, it's, it's too difficult. My, my wife and I, uh, I pride myself in being a multitasker. It's getting less and less as I get older. Uh, but, um, but sometimes when my wife is talking to me, I'm on my phone. <laughs> and suddenly she stops the conversation and I realized something has happened, and she said, <laughs> and she says, can you please not look at your phone, can we just chat? Uh, but we have got so used to multitasking, to doing this, that we have no time for appointments. We spend so much time on Facebook, where is the time to be having parenting dis uh, appointments with people? Um, uh, I'm, I'm uh, about to go on a on a sabbatical to write a book on discipling for a global perspective on discipling. And um, um, a guy I discipled about 10 years ago, um, he found out that I was doing this and he sent me this letter. He's in the business world, uh, he's in the Middle East now, 
uh, but he's continuing as a vibrant Christian. Uh, and he told me, he wrote, here is something that I find unique in those times that you invested in me. You shared, you slowed me down. The world runs at a rapid pace. We need to slow down, but there is no provision for that. Quiet time with God is one of those times. Discipling can play a vital part in slowing people down, helping them to think. I think one of the things that discipling does, it, it slows them down and slows us down too. And it's very important for our health to slow down. Then we are living in a superficial world. Thousands of friends on Facebook and, and we share about ourselves in a very superficial way. We don't need to be honest. We share the image that you want to project. And so today people uh, share their age, and I haven't gone to any dating sites, but in these dating sites I'm told they share their age, and when the date comes, uh, the date is not what is shared in, on the internet, <laughs> you know. You share what, what, what you want, you don't have to be honest. Slowing down to be honest with a few is sometimes too much of a strain. And then there's a private world. People don't like to open up about their life. They are afraid of betrayal. They just don't trust people. And desperately we need to win back their trust so that we can do that. Okay, so now uh, let me say that uh, discipling and involvement in God's mission go hand in hand. The moment Jesus called his disciples, he included them in a program where they were active in ministry with Christ. When he called his disciples, he said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Uh, there was a communal aspect, follow me, and there was a missional aspect. I will make you to become fishers of men. Without involvement together in mission, it is very tough to disciple people. It's a very, uh, it's a very um, yeah, um, uh, unnatural situation. Now, I think you can mentor people uh, because they are, they are, you're talking about a little more mature people and you, you can mentor people perhaps uh, because they are already involved in mission. But discipling must go with mission. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 6 says, that a, a leader must not be a recent convert because they can get puffed up with conceit and fall. So we don't put new believers into leadership. Sometimes we tend to do that because of their enthusiasm and we can hurt them in that process. Uh, but we need to keep them involved in missions. And, and, we, and we have to find a way. Uh, and we have to keep looking for ways where they can be involved in service. Uh, later, Paul, of course, talked about gifts and, um, and using them in ministry. Uh, for example, with Timothy, he urges Timothy to go and get involved in ministry. In 1 Timothy 4, 14, do not neglect the gift you have been given, you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid hands on you. There was a prophecy made about Timothy which was very important to Paul and that prophecy became the basis of his ambitions for, Paul, for Timothy. And, um, and um, so in 1 Timothy 1.18 he says, this charge I entrust you. He's admonishing him. I'm admonishing you, Timothy, in keeping with the prophecies made previously about you. I'm telling you this, Timothy, so that you can become the great person God intended you to become. So we have ambitions for our people. We work towards the, uh, achieving those ambitions in their life. And as we uh, let them use their gifts, we have to give them space to use those gifts within the program of our ministry. Sometimes we may need to even change our program 
not change the mission unless God clearly says that, but sometimes we may need to adapt our program in order to accommodate the gifts of the, of that, of the people that God has given us. In 2 Timothy 1.6, Paul says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through, in the, through the laying on of my hands. And so, so, so people we disciple are not pawns in the hands of the leader. Um, just used to fulfill their goals and the goals of the organization. Younger leaders today are complaining. They are saying that their leaders don't really care for them. They don't really have a vision for them. Uh, the, I, I met a person who had done a research on relationship between senior pastor and junior pastor in South Asia, uh, in one of the countries of South Asia. And, um, and he said, after his research, when a junior pastor joins the ministry, his hero is the senior pastor. After a few years of ministry, that senior pastor is his demon because he feels he has been used, abused, in order to fulfill. In the biblical idea of the body, God's best for the individual dovetails, harmonizes with God's best for the group. When a person thrives, the group thrives. And, and that's the biblical uh, idea, and we must believe this and work on that premise. Now, Barnabas worked on that premise, and he ended up losing his leadership and his prominence. But what a wonderful legacy Barnabas left behind. So, so um, we, our commitment is to the body of Christ. And we must pay the price that we need to pay for the advancement of our people. Sometimes, of course, sometimes, to achieve their fullest potential, they may need to leave the organization or the church. Um, this happens especially in a youth movement like Youth for Christ, when people after some time realize, now it's time for me to move on. Uh, um, but that's okay. Because our primary commitment is to the kingdom of God, to the body of Christ. I tell our young people in Youth for Christ, I, I'm the longest serving member in Youth for Christ in Sri Lanka. 41 years, full time, 10 years as a volunteer. 51 years. And I always tell them, my primary commitment is not to youth for Christ. It is to the kingdom of God. And that's who has to grow. And God has given youth for Christ as a significant feature, as a significant member of this community that forms the kingdom of God in Sri Lanka. Now, um, so we, 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 if we train someone and he begins to enrich the body, we should be happy that they are enriching the body. Um, of course, some will abuse this and take unethical advantage. Uh, in, in our language, we have a statement that says, when they give me to eat, I will eat, and I will eat and run away. And there are people like that. They eat, they get whatever they can from you, and they will leave. Uh, and that goes with ministry. You can't help it. What to do? You know, that goes with, uh, we can't be bitter. Because if 10 people don't make it and two people make it, that would have been worthwhile, uh, having invested in those two people. Uh, so, um, I, I have a point here that says, uh, my next point is that these amb ambitions become uh, the, the basis of our prayers. But I don't have time for that. But uh, just let me say that the most important thing we do in discipling is praying for our people. Uh, that is something, I mean, the Bible is so clear. Ten of, out of 13 of Paul's epistles, he says he prays for the people he's writing to. And when he writes to Timothy, he says, I pray for you night and day. So we pray for our people. That's, that's very, very important. Uh, let me just um, say, discipling is costly. Discipling is costly. And Colossians 1, 28 and 21, 29 gives us the cost of discipling and describes discipling actually beautifully. He says, him we proclaim, 
warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. That's discipling, proclaiming Christ, warning, teaching. And then he says, the game, the, the, the end, uh, also, three times. Warning everyone, teaching everyone, uh, at, uh, that we may present everyone. Uh, three times he mentions everyone, which means discipling is for everyone. We have, it's very difficult, I, I, I don't know how we're going to do this, but we must try to make sure that everyone is discipled. People like to go to large churches because they can be anonymous in those churches. That is not God's plan. People need to be discipled. And, and so everyone um, has to be discipled. Our structures and uh, programs must be fashioned in order to accommodate everyone. Now the goal to present them uh, is uh, to present everyone mature in Christ. Now, scholars say that this is uh, almost certainly to present them at the judgment, uh, uh, at the second coming, to present them. Lord, here are the people I looked after. You know, I, uh, I used to take my daughter to school, uh, to preschool, uh, on my motorcycle uh, uh, when she was very small. And there was a, a sight I saw that really inspired me. There was this uh, lady who used to have uh, about um, five children she brings in a, in a van and she takes them to the preschool. And they are holding her fingers. So she's going like this, taking these children to the preschool. And when I saw that, I thought, that's the way I want to go to heaven. <laughs> to tell God, Lord, here are the people that I invested in. And there they are, serving you living for you. So that's our goal. But Paul says, for this I toil. This is hard work. This word toil, kopiao in the Greek, is to work, to work hard, to labor, to become tired, to grow weary. You know, try, trying to live the balanced life can be uh, tiring. Um, Jesus is often presented as tired. Uh, uh, at the well in Samaria, the disciples go, but he's, he's there because he's tired. Uh, one of the most miraculous things about the life of Jesus to me was how was he able to sleep in the middle of that storm? You remember he was, there was this huge storm and Jesus is asleep. Uh, commentators said that the day before was such a very busy day for him that he was so tired. Even the the, the, the storm didn't wake him. I mean, this was not a beautiful bunk bed uh, in, in a cabin in the, in the, in the, in the uh, boat. It was a normal boat. But obviously, he was very tired. Uh, for, for most of us, the balanced life is our cross. Um, and um, of course, there have to be sources of renewal. Otherwise, we are going to get into huge trouble. Uh, there it has to be, it, it can't be a drivenness that comes out of a drivenness to succeed. Uh, but, you know, we have to have our devotions. We have to worship God in the community. We need to fulfill family obligations. We need to do our job or our studies well. We have to have contacts with our society, our neighbors. We need to be informed about the world around us. We need to have fun time preferably with our families. We need to take regular exercise. I mean, reading a list like this makes you tired, you know. <laughs> so where's the time for discipling? Well, we find time for what is important. We find the time for that. And, and, um, uh, and so we, we, uh, we need to always bear in mind personal appointments when we schedule, when we fill our diaries. We need to bear in mind that we have to give time. You, we don't take too many talks, for example, because if you take too many talks, you won't be able to have many appointments. So we, we, we take that into consideration when we do that. So we struggle, we, we, we toil. The next word is struggling. 
Now that word is agonizomai, uh, which is, um, uh, which is uh, uh, a word that is used from, from the battlefield. Um, wrestling, battling, fighting. Uh, Paul uses it for uh, Epaphras, who is always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. Struggling is agonizomai. He's wrestling in prayer for you, uh, for the Colossians. Discipling is a battle for the souls of people. That's a battle we wage. In Paul's epistles to the, uh, the epistle to the Galatians, you find him battling for the soul of the church. Um, and uh, uh, here, there he does it through um, exhortation, rebuke, and sometimes amazingly sharp language that some of us would be reluctant to use. But Paul does it because, um, because he's battling. So, so we are battling for the souls of people. And we do that through prayer, through confrontation, through teaching, through meeting, and whatever. And then he says, with all the energy that God gives us. Now this is one of the beautiful things about the Bible, about the Christian life. God never calls us without equipping us with the strength to do that. It's his energy. And, um, and uh, this, is, this is what is so important for us if we are going to do our ministry. Let me just give you an example. Some of you have mentioned how I uh, talked at the Urbana conference. Uh, I remember going for one Urbana conference um, before that, um, we had, um, uh, it was just before Christmas. I left on Christmas Day midnight. And, um, and uh, 